Well, hey there, YouTube. It's time for another video. And how would you like great high notes? And if you're a singer, who wouldn't like great high notes? After 30 years of doing this, most people come in, they want great high notes. So who wouldn't? This is a follow up to a voice teacher reaction video that I did. Um, uh, Jeff Tate, Queensryche, Take Hold of the Flame. And he got me thinking about high notes. And you know, when you watch Jeff Tate sing, you're going to think about high notes because the guy just lives up around B's and C's and then goes even higher than that. So I thought, you know, why? What makes him able to do that? And what makes all these great singers able to sing amazing high notes? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a second, but we're going to go down a road we haven't gone down before. And the answer is probably going to surprise you and not going to be what you find all over the place on YouTube and not even what I've talked about before. Because I could talk about mix and I could talk about head voice and I could talk about resonance and I could talk about all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that's all true and it's all important and I'll talk about it again, but not today. Today, I'm going to go down a little bit of a different road. But let me, let me first say I'm Mike Goodrich. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm the creator of the Inner Singer podcast, Inner Singer Singing Programs, and all things Inner Singer. And speaking of the Inner Singer which I will do in just a second after I thank all my subscribers and all you folks that are watching, which I really, really appreciate. Thank you so much. Um, and now we'll go down the inner singer road. You know, the inner singer is the inner game. When I created the inner singer and the inner singer brand back, oh gosh, it didn't start as the inner singer. It started as something else back in about 2008, 2009. When I was, I began to be very, very curious because by that, by that time I'd been teaching, you know, almost 20 years, 18 or so. And I started noticing kind of a, a pattern in, in a lot of singers, myself back in the day, and singers that I taught, singers my buddies and friends and other teachers taught, that were, were really, really good teachers, teaching really good singers. And the same challenges for these singers would always happen. They'd choke on the high notes. They'd go to an audition, they needed help with a high note. They'd go to a recording session, they needed help with a high note. They'd whatever. They were afraid of high notes. Even if they could do them in the lesson really well, they'd go out in public and something would happen. And I became very interested in what that might be because I couldn't figure out why, you know, like even myself, a high note would seem high doing it for somebody but very easy if nobody was around. And you know, and I started thinking about it, you know, because the voice, voice doesn't know high notes. The body doesn't know high notes. Our vocal cords, which I said I wasn't going to talk about, but I, and I won't. But you know, the vocal cords, the resonance, all these things, everything works. And the voice isn't saying, oh gosh, that's a high note. What's going on there? I'm afraid of that. You know, after 30 years of doing this, Singers don't lose their low notes. You know, I've, I've never had any singer come in afraid of low notes, except, you know, except for the odd, you know, song that has an extreme low note that somebody's a little bit worried that they're going to gravel out on. But, you know, that's rare. I mean, like 99% of the people over 30 years have been concerned with the high notes and their higher range and being able to do that in front of somebody or just even alone. And so I thought, okay, well, these voices will all do it. Like Jeff Tate's amazing and all these singers are unbelievable, but you'd be quite surprised that um, a lot of voices are really capable of this stuff. So what is it that makes or allows one person to be able to do it and another person to not be able to do it? If we agree that you know, the, a, a set of vocal cords, you know, they, granted, some people are really, really gifted. Tate, obviously gifted. A lot of these people that I do voice teacher reactions on, all of them, really, really gifted. But I got to tell you, after hanging around voice for the last 40 years, I mean, seriously, and teaching for the last 30, I have seen amazing voices come through the studio. Amazing. And my friend's studios and other studios, just incredible. And I would say that probably the biggest surprise to me was that there are so many potentially great voices that will never be heard. 
They will never realize their potential. Nobody will ever hear them or hear of them. Why? Why is Tate out there tearing it up and all these people out there tearing it up? What's the difference? And I really began to, to get very interested in that. And I came upon a good answer that uh, really surprised me-ish. Years ago, there was a book called um, Psycho-Cybernetics, which I did not read, but my dad read. Flash forward to years later in 2008, I would read a book by John Asareff, who's an expert on the brain. And the book was called The Answer. And it talked about this thing called the cybernetic mechanism in the brain. And the cybernetic mechanism in the brain, I have come, I have gone on to basically call our vocal thermostat. Now, we all know how a thermostat works. You know how a thermostat works. It's, it's Southern California here. It's very, very hot today, even though it's early in the morning. So already when I walked outside, it's like, oh boy. So our thermostat inside for the air conditioner, I'm out in my studio outside, inside is set to 72. So when the temperature gets begins to get hotter than 72, the cybernetic mechanism in the air conditioner, the thermostat, kicks on, brings the air conditioner on so the temperature comes down to 72, and then it goes off. So that's where it's set. In the winter time, we'll say if we set it to 72, if it starts getting colder than 72, then boom, the heater comes on. And it's triggered by the cybernetic mechanism in the thermostat. What does that have to do with high notes? I'm glad you asked. We have a cybernetic mechanism in our brain. And that's our vocal thermostat. Wherever that is set is going to determine our voice and our vocal results. So if we go to the best teacher in the world and we are doing the best technique in the world and yet our vocal thermostat, let's take a tenor because I'm a tenor. Let's just take one. Um, yeah, and I'm working with a fellow now who's, just, who's singing right now. Now, E's and F's above high C in the Jeff Tate range, right? When he first came to me, and he actually won a contest. He's a great guy, great singer. He won a contest to, to be able to study a half, for a half hour with me. And when he first, when I first worked with him about two years ago, he was singing E flats and E's and F's above middle C, down here. E flat four, E F, and really struggling for an F sharp. Now he's singing those like it's a walk in the park, and he's singing an octave higher. Why? Technique, obviously, but also a huge mindset shift. His vocal thermostat was set low because either, either because it was set low, we, know, we don't know if it's just set low and so that's what he's topping off at, or because the vocal mechanism wasn't registered properly yet that you kind of get used to just being able to sing that high. It's sort of like that, um, I think it's a flea. I don't know how anybody ever did this, but uh, I guess any kind of, a, a, well, we'll take the elephant. Everybody knows this story. You take a big giant elephant that's incredibly powerful, right? And you chain it to a stake. And every time it tries to, to, to go any further than the length of the chain that it's on, it, it can't move because of the stake that it's tied to. Well, after a few weeks go by and it gets very used to going so far and not being able to go any further, you can literally take the chain off and put a string in place of the chain and the elephant will not go any further. Why? Because he's been conditioned that that's as far as he can go. His thermostat, his cybernetic mechanism, I don't know if all of us actually have a cybernetic mechanism, but that's how it actually works. He has now been conditioned. So either this student of mine was conditioned 
because they couldn't get any higher that they can't go any higher. And so boom, boom, just topping out, right? That's where the vocal thermostat is set. So as a teacher, I have to know that I not only have to deal with the voice and the technique, but I have to deal with where the mind is set and where that vocal thermostat is set and how to begin to recalibrate that up. Now, really, really, really important for us all to know where our vocal thermostats are set. And we can pretty much determine that by our vocal ability at this particular time. So now, because our results will pretty much tell us. Now, the interesting thing about that is these great singers like Jeff Tate and all the people that I've done voice teacher reactions on, whether by nature or, or on purpose, their vocal thermostat is set high. And that's why they are able to, to pull this off when the stakes are high. That's why they go in and sing and at, at, at the Grammys or in big arenas with 50,000 people or recording sessions or television or whatever, and they don't choke. They go in, bam, and they nail it. You know, that's why it's a walk in the park. That's why they can do it so naturally and easily and on kind of automatic pilot in air quotes. Because everything is now in their implicit memory system. As I mentioned in the, the video, we're all with Take Hold of the Flame. We have an explicit memory system, implicit memory system. When we're driving and learning how to drive and looking at everything and figuring everything out and paying attention, that's our explicit memory system. We are very conscious of everything. After we get used to doing that for a while, the brain says, looks like he's going to be doing this a lot. Let's make this easy and something he doesn't have to think about. And so it gets filed away into the implicit memory system. And all of a sudden it's like, now they've got to give us a text, a, a, a ticket for texting. And women like to put on their makeup. I've ever, you know, it's so automatic now that we figure oh, I can do all this other crap and drive at the same time, you know, although we shouldn't, right? Of course we shouldn't. Um, but the point is, it goes from the explicit memory system to the implicit memory system. If the cybernetic mechanism is set low, let's say for a tenor, it's set like an F or an F sharp. If anything's higher than that, we got to come out of our implicit memory system and go and, and start thinking. And now, now we're in our head. And if we don't have the technique to pull it off, you know, we're hosed. So it takes great technique and it takes a vocal thermostat that is calibrated high so that you can reach your potential. And like I say, these, these great singers out there by nature or because they've learned or whatever, our vocal, they've done what the athletes have done, right? They've done what the athletes have done. And they have upped their game by recalibrating their cybernetic mechanism. So how do you do this? Well, I'm going to give you a cool way to do it. There's a really cool thing about the brain that can work for us. It can work against us too. But I'm going to tell you how it can work for us. The way it works is that a part of the brain doesn't know the difference between real and imagined. The way that works against us is if, you know, we're watching a scary movie or we're taking in all the news and we're doing all that, is that our brain, you know, really thinks that whatever is going on, we're actually experiencing. That's why you get all weird and fidgety when you're watching a movie and cortisol and adrenaline and all that. Okay. Even if you consciously tell yourself it's only a movie, it's only a movie. Yeah. You cannot reason with your brain. You know, the brain does not get that. You can say, oh, no, no, no. I know, I'm, I know that's on a screen. It's separate from me. It's not me. I'm not really going through that. But the brain is saying you're going through that. It's not on a screen. This is real. So you can't really trick the brain like that. But you can trick it in a way that helps you. And that is, and they've done a lot of research on this. They've done research on this with pianists, with singers, with basketball players, where they will take somebody that really, really, really visualizes and imagines something. And they will take somebody that is going through the same thing. Let's take like this. There we go. I'm doing this. Drinking water or whatever. And they wire, they wire up my brain. They wire up somebody else's brain. And I'm drinking the water. The person that's watching me 
they are watching me drink the water, their brain fires in a similar way just because they're watching. That's mere neurons. I'm not even talking about that. But if they imagine drinking the water, their brain will fire in a similar way. The way they did it with basketball players is at a free throw line, they would have uh, a team, you know, shooting free throws, practicing that. Then they would have a team that would visualize and imagine for the same amount of time that the people actually physically did it. And they would imagine, they would just see the ball going through the hoop, see it, see it, see it, see it. When it finally came down to going on the court and, you know, seeing who was the best, they were about neck and neck, right? The people that physically practiced were no better than the people that just imagined practicing. They've done it with singers, they've done it with pianists. This is really, really, really true stuff. And it's crazy. And this is peop- this is the- these are things that people have known for years and years and years before it was actually tested and scientifically proven. So, you can raise your thermostat with your imagination, with creative visualization. You can take a song that's a challenge for you, that goes into areas of the voice that you can't sing yet. And you can do two, th- you a couple of things. There's one cool exercise that I developed that I totally love. One is, you learn the song really, really well, so you know the words, you know everything inside and out. You put the song on, and you mouth it with all the feeling and emotion in the world. Like take hold of the flame or something. And you just, but you don't sing it. But you say the words and you allow Jeff Tate's voice to pour through you. And you feel the emotion and you feel the energy and you feel what it would feel like to be able to do that as if you are doing it. That's one way. Another way is to just sit and visualize and get into the feeling of what it feels like to sing like that. Even if you don't know, imagine, pretend you're an actor now and you're feeling and you see and you're standing on the stage and you're looking out at the audience and you're just really feeling it. You're getting into it and you just bang. And and your brain begins to develop a familiarity with those notes, even though it's imaginary. What happens is neurons that fire together wire together in the brain A belief, in other words, is basically a neuron and a neuron and a connection between the two. Completely oversimplified, but good enough for this, right? So you got a neuron, you got a neuron. And right now, you've got a wiring that is pretty fortified that says, I can only sing to an F or an F sharp. Or as a woman, I can only sing to an A or B flat, you know? And that's a pretty fortified, and you've got proof, right? You really can't sing any higher, you know? You can, you can validate that by saying, look, this is as high as I can sing. But since that is really fortified, right? You not only work on the technique of the voice with a good teacher, but you also begin to change and recalibrate your cybernetic mechanism, your vocal thermostat, by imagining with your imagination and you do the two exercises that I just explained to you, and you change, there's a lot more to go into, but I'm not going to it. I want to try and keep this video short. I I tend to make long videos, and I want to make this a little shorter. And you do it with your imagination, okay? So that starts raising your vocal thermostat. And all of a sudden, in your imagination, now you've got this neuron and this neuron, and this belief that's forming that high notes are easy, you know? And now you've got a little thread, boom, boom. It's a little thread, but the more you keep imagining and visualizing, the more you keep doing that creative stuff, your brain just keeps getting that high notes are easy. And every time you imagine singing that song and it going great and it feeling amazing, your brain gets that, wow, I just sang that, I sang that song. It doesn't know you didn't. And that thread gets a little, a little stronger until the more you do it, it gets fortified and becomes a rope. And you know what happens? Not only does that get fortified as a new belief, but the other one begins to atrophy. And now your vocal thermostat is raised. Okay, so that's really, really important. I wanted to go down this road because I did the Inner Singer podcast. I do the Inner Singer podcast. The first 68 of those are all about this, and it's free. You know, it's really, really important information. And, you know, you can trust after 30 years of doing this and seeing countless singers and seeing that it is the mindset and how you set your mind 
that is going to determine what you do with your voice and how successful you are, not your technique. Absolutely not your technique. Technique's important, but we all know we hear famous singers that have a crap technique. You know, we might not even like their voices. They might not even have any range. And yet, we love them, right? We would never change them. Why is that? Because it's what they believe about themselves and their voice. So anyway, enough said. Uh, thank you so much for watching this. If you would like a video on this, plus two other videos, go jump and get my free singing accelerator video series. I've got one on singing in the brain, one on the magic of vowels, one on authentic performance. They're all really, really great. That's all I'll say. Just go get them. You'll really like them. Uh, if you'd like my free ebook, The Five Biggest Mistakes Singers Make While Singing in the Mix or Belting, link is in the description as well. And i um, got another... Yeah, I, th I think if you get the video series, I give you another book called The Eight Mindsets of Successful Singers, The Singer's Checklist. Um, if, if I, I think I give that as a bonus with the video series. If I don't and you want that, you, you contact me because I don't have a link for it. Uh, that's crazy, huh? Anyway, so subscribe. Um, yeah, I'm excited about all the subscribers. It's so cool. Hit the bell for notifications. Comment. I love your comments. That's why I'm doing all these things and uh, I know what to do. Uh, like your thumbs up if you like it. Um, I have a new service, by the way, called Wissio. I have a Wissio page, and um, which the link will be in the description. You're looking probably at the banner right now, where I will give you vocal advice, feedback, and some tools to help you um, go to the next level. What it is, is on that page, um, you can make a video, you can submit an audio, and you can ask a question. But uh, the video, the audio, whatever, of you singing, you send it to me. I will make you a video giving my feedback, my analysis, although I don't like the word analysis, because what I also do is I give you tools to help take you to the next level. I don't just say, well, you need this, 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 and this, see ya. I say, you know, you, know, you could really benefit from this, 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 and here are this, this, and this. Here's, what's to, here's what to do, okay? Really affordable, really, really cool service. I'm really excited about it, so you can check that out as well. Anyway. There are videos floating around here that you would want to see. They're, all, uh, they're recommended. And uh, big surprise, I created them. So I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much. This went longer than I wanted it to, but I hope you found it really, really helpful. Let me know if you want more of this information. It is so important, okay? I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.